In the previous segment, we have discussed uh, press and media freedom and the notion of media regulation and its role in protecting and ensuring media pluralism and independence. In this segment, we are going to consider how the principle of media regulation and pluralism and independence are implemented with regard to one particular form of media, the written press. As with the previous segment, I'm going to begin with some examples. On March 4th, 2016, the Turkish authorities seized Zaman, the largest Turkish newspaper. The newspaper had been very critical of the current government and its policies. The seizure was ordered by an Istanbul court on the basis that it spread propaganda that destabilized Turkey. The court also appointed a number of trustees to manage the newspaper. Following the court order, the police raided the headquarters using tear gas and water cannon. This was one amongst many examples of the Turkish government taking over and controlling media outlet, which it considered to be critical of the government. That has become, unfortunately, a fairly common uh, pattern in, in the country, but not only in that country. This is also an example of rule by law, as opposed to the rule of law. By this, I mean a clear example of abuse of the spirit and letter of the law and, in effect, an abuse of power. More specifically, the measures taken by the government violated the three-part test, which we have highlighted last week, legality, the valid ground, and necessity. Let me turn to another example, an older one, in Africa. Under Zimbabwe's 2002 Access to Information and Privacy Act, a government-appointed commission has the power to grant or deny accreditation to the written press. As a result, in 2003, it denied Zimbabwe's only independent daily newspaper a license. That uh, newspaper is called, is called Daily News. It appealed the refusal of the renewal of the license and challenged the constitutionality of the law. However, it lost both legal challenges and, as a result, suspended its operation. It was eventually allowed to reinitiate its publication activities in 2011 following election and some limited political changes in the country. However, this example highlights well the risk associated with official license or accreditation schemes for the media, which are not based upon and respect independence and pluralism. The issues in Zimbabwe were not so much in the existence of a regulatory body established by a law, although some will argue that this is part of the problem, but it resided first and foremost in the fact that this regulatory body, that commission, was appointed by the government, thus unlikely to be independent from the government, and that commission could decide whether or not a newspaper could be established. Both the lack of independence of the regulatory body and the existence of a licensing scheme for newspapers contradict international standards related to press freedom. Let's consider this in turn. First, the nature of the regulatory body. We have reviewed in the uh, previous segment the importance of independence in the regulation of the media. While international human rights standards do not prescribe a specific model of press regulation, there is overall agreement that self-regulation is the best system for protecting press freedom, meaning freedom of the written press. What do we mean by self-regulation? As explained previously, it is a form of regulation that relies exclusively on voluntary compliance. There are no law or government schemes dictating its existence or its activities. It often takes the form of an association, which members create and join freely because they believe in the values and objective 
of the self-regulatory body. In the context of press freedom, such bodies are supposed to regulate the profession. It is regulation of the sector by representative of the sector. This is a system in place in the United States, for instance. I shall clarify that a model of press regulation based on a law is not prohibited by international law. So, for instance, the regulation of the Britain press in many Western European countries is done through a regulatory body that has been established through a law. It's not a self-regulatory body, but it's what is called a statutory body. It is acceptable from the standpoint of freedom of expression, provided it meet the three-part test, which we have discussed in the previous week, and includes sufficient safeguard for media freedom, which are independence from government, commercial and special interest, established via a consultative and inclusive process, democratic and transparent in the selection of members and decision making, actual respect and protection of diversity and pluralism, and accountability, including accountability to the public. So these five guarantees must be at the heart of any kind of statutory regulation driven by the government through a law. None of these safeguards applied to the uh, case we have identified earlier, the Zimbabwe Media and Information Commission. The Zimbabwe examples point to a second problem, the allocation of accreditation or licenses. What is a licensing system? In many countries, these licenses are required for publishing in print or for broadcasting, and journalists can also be required to get a license to write. They are basically an authorization that written press or other forms of outlet or individual journalists have to get before they can proceed with their activities. In fact, these schemes, these licensing schemes, are often used by government to suppress alternative, critical or diverse opinion and ideas and media outlet. Now, the licensing system may make sense as far as broadcasting is concerned for technical reasons. The signals that carry broadcasting are limited, but they must be shared with a number of other actors, not only broadcasters, but also the aviation, military actors. Attributing those signals thus require regulation. However, License for the print media do not respond to any technical reason and are thus not required. Let me cite here the legal analysis by the Press Freedom Organization Article 19 regarding license for the print media. I quote them. The establishment of a publication is clearly an important way of imparting information and ideas and so an exercise of the right to freedom of expression. A licensing scheme presents an obstacle to this activity, which may range from a minor bureaucratic hurdle to an impossible barrier. Such a scheme is therefore an interference with the right to freedom of expression and must meet the three-part test in order to be justified. Licensing schemes are problematic because they may easily be abused, for example, to prevent opponents of the government from voicing their opinion. This is particularly true if the scheme is administered by a non-independent body and there are no clear criteria for the awarding of the license. Even an independent administered licensing scheme can induce media outlet to practice self-censorship for fear of losing their license. In fact, all observers and courts in many parts of the world have concluded that the best way to encourage the pluralism and independence of the written press is by abolishing legal and administrative obstacles to the establishment of newspaper and magazine and by enabling free and genuine competition between them. In practice, it means that anyone who wishes to open, to create, to establish 
a magazine, a newspaper, should be able to do so without seeking the authorization of anybody. In conclusion of this section on the written press and the regulation of the written press, I wanted to quote from a very important um, case, which uh, is coming from the United States. In Grosjean versus American Press, the publishers had challenged the law imposing a tax on publication with a circulation of more than 20,000. The Supreme Court felt that the law constrained the press twice over, once as a tax on advertising revenues and then as an incentive to limit circulation. And then the court cited a very important standard which I am going to uh, repeat to you. The evils to be prevented were not the censorship of the press merely, but any action of the government by means of which it might prevent such free and general discussion of public matters as seems absolutely essential to prepare the people for an intelligent exercise of their rights as citizens. That's a, a very important uh, standard here and, and one which is at the heart of why uh, press freedom should be as little regulated. By press freedom I mean the, the freedom of the written press and the regulation of the written press should be the object as, of as little as possible interference on the part of the government. And the fact that it relies on papers to be published means that there is no real technical reason for the government to intervene and to interfere with uh, the written press. For all those reasons, the, um, the position of many courts around the world has been to insist that self-regulation or a regulation with no government interference must be the norm.